Praise the Lord. In the book of Habakkuk, chapter 3, verses 17 to verses 18, that is written, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines, the labor of the olive shall fail, and the field shall yield no meat, the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. And then in verse 19, The Lord God is my strength. He'll make my feet like hind's feet, and he'll make me to walk upon mine high places to the chief singer on my stringed instruments. Notice in verse 18 that is written, Yet I'll rejoice in the Lord, I'll joy in the God of my salvation. It does not say that I will joy in the God of my provisions. Yes, God is the God of provisions. The Bible says in Philippians 4, 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. For 19 years, since 1995, when I was born again and began preaching the gospel. At the time that I was born again, I was a prize fighter. And so when I was born again, I hung up my gloves and stopped prize fighting and began preaching the gospel. Since that time, 19 years now, I do not get paid a salary. I don't box for a living anymore. I don't work a secular job. I preach the gospel. First Corinthians chapter nine, verse 14 says, even so hath the Lord ordained that they which preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And God, according to his word, has supplied all my needs for the past 19 years. The Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want, Psalm 23, verse one. And I can tell you that is true. As it is written in Psalm 37, I've been young, but now am I old. Yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. God supplies all of our need. The Lord is our shepherd we shall not want. He is the God of provisions, but that's not what it says in Habakkuk, the reason why we joy. You see, if we joy in the Lord, the God of our provisions, if that's why we're rejoicing, if that's why we're happy, what are you going to do in those times when you're in need? You see, again, in Philippians 4, 19, that is written, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus, our Lord. In order for him to supply your need, you must first be in need. And in the times you're going through need and waiting for the Lord to supply your need, can you rejoice then if you join the God of your provisions? There are times you may have to go without. The Apostle Paul, the Apostle of the New Testament says, I know how to be abased and how to abound. If we only rejoice in the Lord when we're abounding, what are we going to do when we are abased? The Apostle Paul says, I know how to be abased. There are times you may go without. There are times you may not have anything. God will supply your need. What are you going to do in those times? We don't join the God of our provisions, though he is the God of provisions. No, we join the Lord, the God of of our salvation. It does not say I'll join the God of my healing. Yes, God heals. Psalm 103 says, who forgiveth all thine iniquity, who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases. God does heal, and I have seen him heal over and over again. Jesus Christ says, These signs shall follow them that believe, they shall lay hands on the sick, and they shall recover. And for the past 19 years, I've seen this sign follow them that believe, laying hands on the sick and people recovering, God healing them. But that's not why we rejoice in the Lord because in order for God to heal you, you must first be sick. We live in an imperfect world. This world is corruptible. This world is passing away. Sin entered into this world and this world one day is, is going to end. And we live in a corruptible body. One day, praise God, if you're saved, you'll be able to put on a new body, but right now we live in a corruptible body in a corruptible world. Therefore, you're gonna get sick. If you're not sick today, if you live for another few years, in a few years times, you're gonna experience sickness. Everybody does. 
Even in the New Testament, in the book of Philippians, the Apostle Paul spoke of a man named Epaphroditus. That's a mouthful of a name, but the Apostle Paul commends him. Why? He served the Lord so much so, he got sick. We have a corruptible body. Our flesh is weak. Even Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who is God manifest in the flesh, at times on this earth, he was so tired, his disciples had to leave him at certain places to go buy food. Yes, the flesh gets weak. And if you're in the flesh, it does get weak. And at times, you'll get sick. And in serving the Lord and pushing our bodies, we experience sickness. God heals us, but that's not why we rejoice. Because if we rejoice because God heals us, what are we going to do? when we experience sickness. What are we gonna do when we are sick and waiting for God to heal us? No, the Bible does not say I will join the Lord, I'll join the God of my healing. It says I'll join the God of my salvation. It does not say I'll, I'll join the God who answers prayer, but God does answer prayer. In fact, that's how I got born again. Back in 1995, I was seeking for the God who answers prayer and based on the promise of Jesus Christ in Mark 11, chapter 11, verse 24, he says, Therefore I say unto you what things serve you desire. When you pray, believe that you receive them, and ye shall have them. For 19 years, I've seen God keep his promise. He answers our prayers just like he promised he would do. And that's how I'm living. He answers our prayers. However, he doesn't answer our prayers on our timing. You see, we have no scripture promise to tell us to demand God when to answer our prayers. Today, if I'm hungry and if I wanted a pizza, I could take a mobile phone and I can call a pizza restaurant and they can guarantee me in 30 minutes that pizza would arrive to the address I give them. But God doesn't have such guarantees. No, he answers prayers and his time. And if you rejoice only because God answers your prayers, what are you going to do in those times that you're waiting for him to answer your prayers? What are you going to do in those times that you're praying to God and it seems a prayer is coming late? When Jesus Christ walked this earth in the book of Mark chapter 5, there was a man named Jairus. He came to Jesus and prayed the Lord that he would come and lay his hand upon his daughter who was sick, nine to death, and Jairus' prayer was that for the Lord to lay her hand upon her so that she would not die. And the Lord said he would go. He said, yes, that was an answer to prayer. And as they began walking to Jairus' house for the Lord to lay his hand upon her as Jairus had prayed so that his daughter would not die, a woman with an issue of blood came up to Jesus and touched the hem of his garment, was healed, and Jesus began talking to her and let her know that her faith had made her whole. And as she spent, he spent time talking with this woman who was healed with an issue of blood, and they began walking further to Jairus's house. People came from his home, Jairus's home, to tell him, why bother the master anymore? Thy daughter is dead. How many times have we prayed and it seems that God was late? How many times have we prayed and according to our eyesight, it seems God didn't answer. Here in Mark chapter 5, Jairus had prayed for Jesus to lay his hand upon his daughter so that she would not die. But in the process of going to his house, she in fact died. Jesus, when he heard that, when he heard the people tell Jairus, your daughter is now dead, Jesus told Jairus, be not afraid, only believe. You remember Jesus Christ says, what things serve you desire? When you pray, believe that you receive them and ye shall have them. Jairus believed and they went to his house and, and his daughter was dead. The people were mourning. Christ tells the people she is not dead but sleepeth. And they all laughed him to scorn because see, they knew she was really dead. Christ kicked them out of the house. If you cannot take God at his word and you cannot believe what he says, there's nothing really the Lord can do for you. If you want to mock God's word and say, I don't believe that's not true, the Lord cannot do anything for you. When he told the people that she is not dead, she sleepeth, and they laughed in the scorn, 
Christ had them removed from the house. And he with his three apostles, Peter, James, and John, and the mother and father of the daughter, Jairus and his wife, the mother, father, daughter, went into the room, and Jesus says to her, Talitha kumi, which means damsel, I say unto thee, arise. And she arose and was healed. Though it looked like by the sight of man that the Lord was late in answering prayer, he still answered prayer nonetheless. Therefore, if you only rejoice because God answers prayer, what are you going to do in those times when it seems that God is late? What are you going to do in those times when it looks like God is not answering your prayers? We don't rejoice because God answers our prayers. No, we rejoice in the God of our salvation. It says, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation, not the God of my deliverance. Yes, God does deliver us. Ten years ago, back in 2004, I can't believe it's already been ten years. I can't even believe it's 2014, but ten years ago in 2004, some Muhammadans, which you may call Muslims, they, they grabbed me and another man, and they put us in this little room, and they locked the door, and they used a key, a deadbolt with a key, and locked it. There was no way for us to go out. These were Muhammadans from southern India, and they saw that we were Christians, and they just grabbed us, put us in this room. And they brought this man from the back, and he was going to debate with us. And the way Muhammadans do it is they'll debate with you. They'll debate with Christians. And if you lose the debate, well, then they'll do some physical harm to you. But if they lose the debate, the person who loses the debate, they'll harm him. So they brought us in this room. They locked the door with a key to a deadbolt. We were stuck now, and they had to sit down and wait for this man to come out. And a whole group of them surrounded us, and they brought this man out. He put a set down in front of us, and he tried to set us up. In their debates, they try to set you up. And he says, was the Bible translated from Hebrew and Greek? Now, if we answered yes, then they'll say, well, there's been mistakes in the translations. You have, an you have a, a corrupt Bible in your hands. And then who knows what they would have done to us then. So when they asked us this question, I said, Bible, that is an English word. Yes, B-I-B-L-E is an English word. And I said, Bible is an English word describing an English book. And I have the Bible here in English. The B-I-B-L-E is worn out now, but it used to have Bible on the front, on the cover here. And I said, I have a Bible here. And I said, you'll not see any Hebrew and Greek in this Bible. It's in English. And I had the other men confirm that. And that poor man who wanted to debate with me, he, he went into shock. Oh no, he lost the debate. The other men shook my hands, unlocked the door, let us leave, and then they locked it afterwards. I have no idea what they did to that other man, but God delivers us. But that's not why we rejoice. No, we don't rejoice because God delivers us because if that's the reason why you rejoice because God delivers you, what are you gonna do when you need deliverance? What are you gonna do in those times when you're waiting for God to deliver you? See, we don't rejoice in the God our deliverer, though he is our deliverer, we rejoice in the God of our salvation. Jesus Christ, when he was on this earth, he sent forth 70 of his disciples to go out two by two to preach the gospel of the kingdom. And when they returned to Jesus, they were happy and rejoicing. They said to the Lord, they said, Lord, even the spirits are subject to us in thy name. What did Jesus Christ say to them? He says to them, Rejoice not that spirits, devils, are subject unto you, but rather rejoice in this, that your names are written in heaven. Yes, Jesus Christ says, These signs shall follow them that believe, and my name shall they cast out devils. And for the past 19 years, since I believed in Jesus Christ, I've seen this sign. I have been able to cast out devils. If I told every story of cast out devils, it'd be a few hours I have to talk to you. It'd be a lot, a long time. I have many experiences in casting out devils, but that's not why we rejoice. No, we don't rejoice in the God who answers our prayers so we can cast out devils. Though we can do so, we rejoice not that spirits are subject to, to us in the name of Jesus. We rejoice 
that our names are written in heaven. Jesus Christ says in Matthew chapter 7 about false prophets that they will say to the Lord, 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 have we not prophesied in thy name? And have we not cast out devils in thy name? And have we not in thy name done many wonderful works? And Christ says, he'll say to those false prophets, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. You see, some people trust that because they can cast out devils, because they can do signs and wonders, because they can do wonderful works, that they can live any way that they want. And you'll find Christians who trust in signs and wonders that, see, God loves me. Look at the signs and wonders that follow my ministry. And they'll do things that are not right. They'll, they'll live in adultery. They'll, they'll marry somebody that's not even their wife. They'll divorce their own wives and marry somebody else's wife. You see this all the time. Or they may deceive people for money or, or try to con people for money. And they do things that are not right. And they give the name of the Lord a bad name for doing such things. You see, we don't rejoice in signs and wonders. We don't rejoice because spirits are subject unto us. We rejoice because our names are written in heaven. Habakkuk said, I will joy in the Lord. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. I learned this back in 1998. I was born again back in 1995. And in 1998, I learned that to rejoice in the God of my salvation. You see, in 1998, my wife and I, we went to live in Pattaya, Thailand to, to preach the gospel. Pattaya, Thailand is a place that needs the Lord and needs preachers of the gospel. There's a lot of sin. There's a lot of bars. There's a lot of evil that takes place in that city. And Back in 1998, before my wife and I, we had children, we, we went down to Pattaya, Thailand to preach the gospel on the streets and the public to those people that, that needed to repent and to believe the gospel. Well, we got to sit at a church there. They invited us to live there. We didn't ask them to live there. They, they saw that, we're, that I was a preacher of the gospel. They saw that we came here to preach the gospel. And, and the owner of the church, they allowed us to live there. They had a nice church grounds and they had a, a dormitory and they gave us a free room to stay there while I preached the gospel. Praise the Lord. And so we're down there in Pattaya, Thailand back in 1998, living at the dorm of this church and preaching the gospel. However, whenever you preach the gospel, you'll be persecuted. If I meet a Christian who's never experienced persecution, I can say that's a Christian that does not preach the gospel. The Bible says, yea, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If you're not suffering persecution, according to God's word, you must not be living godly in Christ Jesus. Even in, in so-called free countries like the United States of America, I've even spent time in jail there for preaching the gospel. And the police didn't call it preaching the gospel. They called it blocking vehicular and pedestrian traffic. That was the technical term for preaching the gospel. You see, if you preach the gospel, you'll be persecuted. And as we sit at this church and was preaching the gospel, well, people got upset. People got angry in the streets. They're controlled by organized crime and what you might call mafia. And they, they sent hitmen to the church. We weren't there. My wife and I were out preaching the gospel one evening and hitmen showed up at the church and they, they waved a gun around and they made these threats how they're going to kill us and kill the people at church. And of course they weren't going to because if they were, they would have done it without saying anything. They were just trying to scare us and scare them. Well, it worked. It scared the people at that church and they decided we got to get rid of Brother Tony and his wife. They've brought trouble. We don't want trouble here at this church. And so they did not just kick us out of the church. No, they, they did it very silently and very slowly. They, they stopped buying food for us. See, we live by faith and we don't ask or beg, but as we lived at the church, they would feed us because we lived there while we're preaching the gospel and they, they stopped buying food and the refrigerator now became empty. Not only that, in the churches, as you know, they take up an offering and you know, they would give us a little bit of the offering as we preach the gospel. They stopped giving us gifts. They stopped giving us blessings. And 
We now had no food and no money, but we were not there to eat or drink. We were there in Patia in 1998 to preach the gospel. So we were not preaching the gospel anyway. If we had money, 20 baht, the two of us on a bot bus, that's a small little mini bus, we could take it from the church, go to the area they're preaching and preach the gospel. It costs us 20 baht there and it costs us 20 baht back, 10 baht each. Well, now that we didn't have money, we had to walk there. So a, a mini bus ride now took, which normally took 30 minutes, now took us three hours of walking. But we did it anyway. The Bible says, thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. So we endured joyfully. We went out to the streets. We walked there to preach the gospel. I had to leave a few hours earlier than normal, but we went nonetheless and preached the gospel nonetheless. And while we're walking and while we're preaching, Hey, we didn't even feel any kind of tiredness or any kind of weariness of the flesh. We were serving the Lord. On our walk back, we knew a sister in Christ who had a noodle stand, and she always said to us that if you ever in the neighborhood, stop by and have some free noodles. Now, we never were in that neighborhood. We used to preach in another area, but because we're walking, we happened to pass the area that she lived in. So we decided, let's go pay her a visit. And as we paid her visit, she pulled out the chairs to a noodle stand, pulled us up to a table, and she got out some water. And that was very important because we don't have water, when you don't have money in Thailand, you can't buy water. You can't drink water out of the tap, out of the faucet here. You have to buy drinking water. Water costs you money. So all day as I've been preaching the gospel, I had not drinking any water. So as we sat down and she pulled out some water, I began drinking that water. I didn't realize how thirsty I was. And I drank so much water so fast that they were amazed at how much water I could drink. She gave us two bowls of noodles and we ate that joyfully, praise the Lord. And God bless that sister. She's now with the Lord. She blessed us there with those noodles. And we were very hungry that day after preaching the gospel and walking all day long. And as we're sitting there and we get to share some testimonies with her and she got very excited. And of course, we never told her we didn't have any money. We didn't share with her that we've been walking all day because we, we don't ask, we don't beg, we don't hint. Back in 1995, I told God, as I saw his promise in his word, therefore I say unto you what things shall be desire. When you pray, believe that you receive and shall have them. I vowed to God, I'm going to place my life on your promise. And if you keep your promise, I'll preach the gospel wherever I go. Not from religion, not from religious study, from my life. You see, if, if God's word was not true, I would not be alive today. I don't ask for money. I don't beg for money. I don't hint for money. I don't tell anybody anything about my financial situation. No, I live by the promise of God. If you ask me, hey, brother Tony, do you have any money? And if I don't have any money, I'm not gonna let you know. No, I've got to deal with God. I've made a deal with him that if he keeps his word, I'll preach his word. I've put my life on his promise that he'll answer prayer. So as we're at this noodle stand, I never shared with this sister in Christ anything about us having to walk. I did not share with her about I had not drink water all day, haven't eaten all day. No, I didn't share anything about that. I'd share testimonies about people hearing the gospel from that day and the different things that took place. Praise the Lord. While I was sharing those testimonies, a thought came to my mind, and you know, a lot of times, man's thinking which gets us in trouble. The Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lead not to thine own understanding. God does not need your help, and he does not need your thinking to help him out. When I look at God's creation and my children now, they're planting flowers, and we're watching these flowers grow, and you know what I learned? God did not need my help when he created the world. He doesn't need your help either. He doesn't need our thinking. No, it says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. But you know, a thought came to my mind. It was not a, 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 a godly thought. A thought came to my mind that while I was sharing testimonies with his sister that maybe God would touch your heart to give us a little blessing of 20 baht. And that way, we wouldn't have to walk the rest of the way home. We could catch the bot bus and be able to sit in the bus and go back home. But that's not what happened. After we shared our testimonies and realized it's getting very late, we said goodbye to the sister and the Lord, and the Lord did not touch her heart. 
Now, when I was walking and preaching, I didn't feel any tiredness or any weariness of the flesh. I was fine. But after sitting down and eating those noodles and I stood up, I realized my back was sore. I realized my, my legs were sore, my knees, my ankles, my body was sore. And as I began walking away from the table, I realized how tired I was. See, we'd, we'd walk three hours there to preach the gospel, and I'd preach the gospel for me an hour or two, and we'd walk to this noodle stand, and after we sat down and got back up, that's when my body realized how tired I am. Naturally, I'm flat-footed. I don't have an arch in my feet. If you're flat-footed like myself and they have a draft in the army, they won't draft you, they won't draft me. If they had a draft in the army, they would never draft me. Right now, of course, I'm too old, but even as I was younger, they would never draft me in the army because I'm flat-footed. Why don't they draft flat-footed people? Well, as you know, soldiers, they gotta do a lot of marching. <laughs> they do hours and hours of marching, and if you're flat-footed and you do a lot of walking, you get blisters on your feet. My feet are covered in scars of blisters. When I do a lot of walking, because my feet are flat-footed, I get blisters wearing shoes. And so, when you get a blister, you know, while you're walking, you just get that rubbing feeling. But when you sit down for a while, those blisters will fill up with liquid. And now they become very sore. So when I got up from that noodle stand to start walking again, I realized I had blisters all over my feet and they had filled up with liquids and now they're very sore. And, and if you've never had blisters on your feet, you may not understand this, but if you've ever had blisters on your feet, you know how painful that can be. So my body was sore, my back was sore, my legs were sore, we're walking, I got blisters on my feet. And then we ate noodles. I'm half Vietnamese and I enjoy eating noodles. I eat noodles just about every day. However, noodles aren't that good for you. You can't eat noodles and go to exercise right afterwards. You can do it with rice and you can do it with bread. When you eat noodles, you have to have time for those noodles to digest. When you eat noodles, they expand in your stomach, especially when you're drinking as much water as I drank that day. And then ate those noodles on top of it, those noodles that expanded in my stomach. So now, as we're walking, I'm sore and I'm tired. Those noodles are expanding in my stomach. And I'm very tired now. I got a belly ache and I'm walking and I'm I'm pushing myself and then it began raining. Now, if you don't wear glasses, it's not a problem to walk in the rain. I wear glasses, sometimes wear contact lenses. Right now I'm wearing glasses again. Back in 1998, I was wearing glasses back then as well. Sometimes I wear contact lenses. If you watch any of my other videos, you don't see me wearing glasses, that means I'm wearing contact lenses. Well, at that time I was wearing glasses like I'm doing now and it starts raining it's hard to do when you're wearing glasses because the glasses get wet and you can't see. And your glasses get fogged up because when it rains, the weather cools down, but your body's hot, it fogs your glasses up. But you've got to see because if you're like me and have bad eyesight, if I take these glasses off, I could walk right into a tree. I could walk right up a sidewalk and fall down and hurt myself. So I needed to see. And also when it rains here, back where we were in Patia, and all that tall grass, it drives the snakes out. So you want to be able to see because you don't want to step on the snake on the side of the road and get bit. And so I was having a hard time. Now my glasses were getting wet. I was getting wet. Had a belly ache from all those noodles that I ate. My body is tired. My legs are sore. I got blisters on my feet. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Bible says, Neither murmur ye, as some of them also murmured, and were destroyed of the destroyer. One of the worst things we can do as a Christian is ask, Why? Yes, the Bible says, trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not to thine own understanding. Sometimes we want to know everything. And we ask God, why? And we start complaining. Well, I started doing that that day as we got out to the highway and it's raining and I'm wet and my feet have blisters. I'm tired, I'm sore, and cars are, are going by me as fast as they can because it's a big highway. It's the biggest highway of Batia, up Sukhumvit Road, and as cars fly by you and you're walking, you feel like you're standing still. And I, why God? Why I'm serving you and I have to suffer like this for? And, and the church, they're kicking me out all because I'm preaching the gospel and they have to go through things like this. Why God? Guess what happened to me? I started getting not only physically tired, but spiritually tired as well. And I got so discouraged and so tired as I murmured 
and complain and asking God why and complaining about how easier it was to be a non-Christian and how easier it was in the days I was a prize fighter than it is serving the Lord and complaining about the way the other Christians are treating me for preaching the gospel and kicking me out of the church. And I, I got so discouraged that I saw a bus stop, and Thai it's called a Salah, it's like a gazebo they put in the bus stops in front of a Buddhist temple of all places. And I went straight to that bus stop, sat down the bench, and actually I laid down and I had completely given up. Well, praise God for God's word. Jesus Christ says, man shall not live by bread alone, but every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Matthew 4, 4. Since I've been born again back in 1995, I've made it a daily habit to spend hours reading God's word. Now, I don't read about God's word. I, I read God's word. This is not a study Bible. This is just the Bible, the authorized version. And all I do is I read God's word every day. In fact, I read so much of God's word that I, I'll read through the Bible once a month. That's 12 times a year. I spend a few hours every day in God's word, reading God's word. And so you get God's word in your heart, and if you have the Holy Ghost in you, the Holy Spirit will bring back God's word to you. You see, if you're not a Christian, if you're not born again, you can read the Bible and it'll make no sense to you. It'll be looking at the like, same as looking at an empty piece of paper. Nothing will come to you. But if you're born again and God's Spirit is in you and you read God's Word and you get God's Word in you, then the Holy Spirit now can bring those scriptures to remembrance. And as I was laying down at that bus stop that night back in 1998, and I had stopped complaining because I was too tired to. I, I had to complain myself out. And as I was laying there, the bus stop, the Holy Spirit began bringing scriptures to my remembrance of the new Jerusalem. Yes, God has prepared a place for us. The Bible says, I have not seen, nor hath ear heard, nor entered into the heart of man the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. The Bible says in the new Jerusalem, the streets are made of gold. Here on this earth, people fight and kill each other over gold. In Bangkok, Thailand, where we're at right now, there's signs all over the city. And in those signs are from the police. They're warning you, beware of snatch thieves. What is a snatch thief? That is somebody drives by in a motorbike, and if you're wearing some gold around your neck, they'll reach over and grab that gold necklace, rip it off your neck, and steal it from you. And if you fight back, they may pull out a weapon on you. And this is so often of occurrence in Bangkok, Thailand, the police have put posters all over the city, beware of snatch thieves. And the cartoon pictures, people and thieves on a motorbike, grabbing a lady's necklace. You see people on this earth, they'll kill each other over gold. But in heaven, that gold you wear around your neck is what the roads are made out of. We walk on that gold. Here on this earth, they'll kill each other, put around their neck in heaven. We're gonna be walking on that gold. It's what they use for concrete. It's what they use to make the roads in the new Jerusalem. The streets are made of gold. People hate each other and kill each other for gold. I used to have a group of friends and we all got on drugs and my friends, they progressed to harder drugs. And of course they began stealing from each other. One of my friends, he started accusing everybody of stealing his gold necklace. And, I was not a Christian at the time, and I did not steal it. And when he accused me of it, I almost let that young man have it. I was upset he would accuse me of stealing his gold. I almost beat him to a pulp. Praise God, I did not do that, and, and I did not steal his necklace from him. All my friends got on drugs. They began stealing from each other. But you see what happens on this earth? People will kill each other over gold. In heaven, in the New Jerusalem, the streets are made of gold. I'm going to that place. Not because I'm worthy. No, no, I'm, I'm worthy of hell. I have sinned. I've come short of the glory of God. The Bible says Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Whoa, that's talking about me. If there is ever a chief of sinners, that's talking about me. I, I am one person who is worthy of hell, of eternal torment, of fire. But I am going to go to heaven I die because of Jesus who had died on the cross for our sins, who was buried and rose from the dead. And I, I called upon his name by faith and I was born again. I was saved. 
God's spirit bears witness with my spirit that I am his child, as the Bible says, and I'm gonna go to heaven when I die. I'm gonna go to a place where the streets are made of gold. In 1998, as that scripture came to my remembrance while I was laying down the scourge of that bus stop, joy flooded my soul. It didn't matter now, I was in the stinky, dirty bus stop. It didn't matter that I was wet from the rain and my glasses were wet and had blisters on my feet and my legs and my body was tired. That didn't matter no more. I'm going to heaven when I die, where the gates are made of pearl, where the walls of the new Jerusalem is made of diamonds. They don't cry there no more. There's no darkness. There's no more sweating there, as you see, I sweat a lot. No, they don't sweat no more in heaven. Praise the Lord. I'm going to that place, that new Jerusalem. The apostle Paul in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 12 speaks of somebody he knew. Most likely he was talking about himself. He says he knew a man. Most likely it was himself who got caught up to the third heavens. And the apostle Paul says that that person, which was probably himself, saw things that were unlawful to utter. He saw things so glorious in the third heavens, he was prohibited from speaking about them. The Bible says, I hath not seen or entered into the heart of man, nor hath ear heard the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. Heaven has been prepared for us. That night in 1998, as I thought about those scriptures, as the Holy Spirit brought them back to my remembrance, I got joy, the joy of the Lord. I began rejoicing on the God who answers my prayers. I began rejoicing on the God who delivers me. I began rejoicing on the God who heals me. I began rejoicing on the God who, who supplies my need. I began rejoicing the God of my salvation. Do you notice that? My is in there, my salvation. It's not some general thing. Salvation can be yours. You can possess salvation. It can be your salvation, you see. I am saved. I have that gift. It's mine, the gift of salvation. It's my salvation. And when we rejoice in the God of our salvation, he gives us strength. Like Habakkuk chapter three, verse 19 says, the Lord is my strength. The Bible says in the book of Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord is my strength. As I began rejoicing in the God of my salvation, I had strength. I could continue walking had another hour or two to walk and I had strength now. I didn't feel those blisters on my feet no more and my legs didn't feel tired, my back didn't feel tired. And as I began walking on that dirt, dirty, wet road, because it just finished raining, and I was covered in rain, I was wet. And as I began walking the road, the cars went by me. They may have felt sorry for me. People in the cars may have said, look at that guy walking on the side of the road. No, they didn't have to feel sorry for me. I felt sorry for them, look at those people. They don't have the Lord, they're going to hell. I felt sorry for them. And as I was walking, I rejoicing, I was singing those hymns of the Christian faith. When the roll is called up yonder, I'll be there. As I was singing those hymns of the Christian faith and rejoicing and walking down that street, praise the Lord, I had no more worries, no more complaints, just praise unto God. And that walk now felt real short. And about an hour later, as we're walking and rejoicing, rejoicing the God of our salvation, we pass a truck parked on the side of the road. We were in a dark area where no pedestrians were, and this truck that was parked there, I thought it was an empty truck. The windows were tinted, and it was very dark there because there's no pedestrians in that area. There was no street lights there. And this truck was parked on the side of the road with tinted windows, it was very dark. And I thought it was an empty truck parked on the side of the road as we walked by it. My wife, praise God for wives, and praise God, uh, the Lord speaks to our wives, amen? And sometimes we need to listen to her, not all the time, but sometimes we need to listen to our wives. You see, sometimes women, they can perceive things men can't. There's many of times I've answered the telephone in the middle of doing something and talked to somebody, and I didn't realize I was rude with them on the phone. And I hung the phone because I was doing something else. And my wife has told me, uh, Brother Tony, you, you were a little bit rude to that person on the phone. They may have thought something bad. Oh, really? I didn't realize I was rude. And I called them back up and apologized and come to find out my wife was correct. They, they thought I was mad at them. They thought I was rude on them for a purpose or for a reason. Praise God for wives. And as we walk by this truck, my wife says to me, I, I perceive there's something wrong with this truck. 
Now, I thought it was an empty truck. I thought nobody was in it. So when Mari says she perceived something was in that truck, I thought it was of a spiritual nature. Maybe a devil was inside that truck. Maybe that truck was used in a crime. Maybe there's something wrong with that truck. So I told my wife as we're walking away from it, well, we can pray for it. And again, in my mind, I'm thinking about devils and spirits and we're praying for this truck parked on the side of the road. As we began praying, the truck door opens and a woman with long hair jumps out. Now that just about scared me. It's the middle of the night in a very dark area. I'm praying for a truck that I think is empty. I'm thinking of lines of spirits and devils. And then all of a sudden the truck door opens. That's scary enough. A woman jumps out with long hair. I thought it was the devil. Almost ran away, but it was a woman. And she jumped out of that truck. And as she jumped out, a, a man jumped out with her. And as she began walking away, the truck began slowly walk, driving beside her with the truck door so open. The man that jumped out with her began pushing her into the truck. And inside the truck, hands came out trying to grab her. And of course, somebody was driving that truck. So there's at least three men and one woman. The Bible says, what you'd have men do unto you, do also unto them. If my wife or my daughter is in that situation where three men were trying to put them into a truck, I'd be very grateful if some man did something about it. Now, I don't believe men are better than women or women are better than men. I believe we each have our giftings. We each have our, our talents. There's some things women do better men. There's some things men do better women. And one thing about women is they're weaker, physically weaker, and men can take advantage of women, do bad things to them. And these were three men trying to force this woman into a truck. And so I, as a man, have a responsibility to do something about it. So I told my wife, please pray. I began running because they had gotten away from us now. They're, we had walked past the truck anyway. They're driving down and she's walking away. So I began running after them to do something. While I was running, I witnessed everything that happened. As the man was pushing the lady back in the truck and people were trying to grab her into the truck, she took a back step and tried to run away, but she had long hair. And that man who was trying to push her in the truck, he, he grabbed her by the hair. And he grabbed her so hard that when he pulled, she went down to the ground. They began pulling her around. And she was going down to the ground, trying to get back up while her hair was being pulled. I was watching this. My heart was beating very fast. I wanted to do something about it, but I had to run to catch them. As I was running after them, he was pulling her hair. She fought and fought and screamed and hair must have come out of her head and maybe hair slipped out of her head, that man's hand. And she able to, was able to break herself free and began running right into the middle of that highway. It had just finished raining that day. The roads were wet. And as she ran in the middle of the highway, a truck going at a high speed almost hit her. They had a slam on their brakes that made that noise. You know the noise I'm talking about, brakes on a, on a wet road, that loud sound that you know there's an accident about to happen, and they almost hit her. And as they slammed on their brakes and they stopped just in time, she went to the passenger side of the door. She opened, passenger side of the truck, opened the door, jumped in the lap of a lady sitting on the passenger side, told the man who was driving to go get out of here. He didn't go nowhere. He looked at her very angry and very mad and he didn't want to do a thing about it. And as she was telling this man to go, that other man who had been grabbing her hair walked over, grabbed her by the hair again, and pulled her right out of the truck. I had been running all this time and witnessed everything that happened. My heart was beating fast and I, I accidentally tackled that man. I, I did not do it on purpose. I'm not a football player. I, I don't tackle people on purpose. I, I just got lost in the moment and ran so fast that I accidentally ran into that man and we both went down to the ground. I, I accidentally tackled him. I didn't mean to. We, we both went to the ground, to the road, and he got up and I got up. And they began telling me in the Thai tongue, and Thai, you don't know her. See, that's Buddhist talk. See, Buddhists, they believe in a thing called karma. That's this impersonal force that if you do bad, bad things will happen to you. And so he's trying to tell me you don't know her. Karma is at work right now. Leave it alone. I took my finger and I pointed to his chest where this idol was under his shirt. It was bulging under his shirt and I pointed straight at his idol and I said, I don't know her, but I know you. 
And I know you don't believe in Jesus. How did I know that? He had an idol on his neck. And I said, if you don't repent to believe in Jesus, when you die, you're going to go to hell. Well, he began yelling at me, Jesus has nothing to do with this. You'll understand why he said that in a minute. And he walked away. As he began walking away, another man came out of the truck. And in his hand was an axe, A-X-E, an axe. Not a red axe that firemen use, no, a, a copper or gold kind of axe that you buy to chop people's heads off. It had a leather wristband on it. And he was running at me in that crouched position with the axe behind him, ready to strike at me. Of course, if he hit me with the axe, I would die. And as I saw him running towards me with that axe, and I had just been rejoicing the Lord about salvation and, and going to heaven and the new Jerusalem about seeing those streets made of gold. Well, I got happy. I thought, here I go, I'm gonna go to heaven. And so as he began running at me with the ax, I knew that I needed to say something. I, I wanted to preach to the man because if I'm gonna die, I'd rather die preaching. I didn't have time to, to organize me a sermon. I didn't have time to open my Bible and find a scripture text. No, I, I, as he came running at me, I just said to him, in the name of Jesus. And then as he pulled the ax up to hit me in the head, he just stopped. And I was confused. And for that few seconds there, time stopped. I looked at him, I looked at his ax, and I was wondering why is he not hitting me with his ax? One thought could be maybe he had a devil in him. And when I said in the name of Jesus, the devil jumped out and he got frozen there. Another thought is, maybe when I said the name of Jesus, he got convicted and, and couldn't follow through with the strike. Or, I personally believe, an angel. Yes, just as there are devils, there's also angels. God, I believe, sent an angel and grabbed his hand because his hand was frozen in the air. He's about to strike me, and his hand was as if it was stuck, it was as if somebody was holding his hand in the air. I saw that myself, and I was looking at that, figuring this out, looking at him, somebody pushed me out of the way. It was my wife. She pushed me out of the way. This man had the ax in the air, and she begins preaching to this man. She says to him, Ty, we don't care what you do to us. You're gonna stand before God in judgment, and God is going to judge you. You need to repent and believe in Jesus. With the ax still in the air, he says, Jesus, I don't care about Jesus. He has nothing to do with this. That'll make sense why he said that in a minute. He pulled his hand free, and he went to that truck and he hit it. Now, I have a hard time watching movies. I don't like fiction. When I see movies and see things in it that just can't come to pass, I get turned off. In fact, I'm so turned off, I don't even watch movies nowadays. I, I can't enjoy fiction. And then I have found also through experience that reality is stranger than fiction. So when that man went to the truck that was still parked in the middle of the highway that that lady had jumped in, he hit the windshield with his ax and after one strike, it didn't crack the windshield, it didn't leave a hole. The whole windshield exploded into millions of little pieces. I never knew that could even happen. If I had seen that in a movie, I would turn the movie off and say, that's fake, I don't even believe that. I did not, I could not believe that one strike from the ax could explode a windshield like that. And as I was sitting there amazed, thinking, wow, that was amazing. How did he do that? What kind of ax is that? How did he strike it like that? And they began walking away. The driver of the truck came out and began yelling at me. No, I, I didn't strike the ax. I didn't strike his windshield with my ax, with the ax. I didn't do that. But he's yelling at me. What's he yelling at me about? He blamed me for his windshield being smashed. You see, in Buddhism, which that man was, and the majority here in Thailand are, they believe in karma, this impersonal force. And they believe that bad things happen to people who do bad things. So if something bad happens to you, it's your own fault. And they don't get involved and try to help people when they're going through bad times. And so the driver of the truck believed, because I helped this lady, bad karma now came, and his windshield got smashed because of me. No, he didn't blame the man who hit his windshield with the ax. He blamed me for helping that lady. I explained to the driver of the truck, I did not smash your windshield. Those guys over there driving away did. If you want to, we can get their license plate and go to the police station and I'll be a witness to you as you file a police report. He says, yeah, we're gonna go to the police station if you don't pay me money to fix my windshield. Well, I, I didn't have money at the time. 
I didn't have money to pay him for the windshield, and he was demanding 5,000 baht, which is a little bit over $100, and I, I did not even have one baht, so he told me he wanted to take me to the police station. If I didn't pay him money, he was going to put me in jail. So I said, okay, we'll go to the police station together, and I got in the back of his pickup truck. My wife got in the back, and the young girl got in the back, and the man drove us to the police station. And on our way to the police station, the young girl told her side of the story. She was a Thai lady, a Buddhist, and she has a Belgian boyfriend, a fiance, and he's in Belgium at the time. And he was gonna come back to marry her and take her to Belgium with him, and that was the deal they made. He was gonna go back to work, save up money, so they can come back here to Thailand and have a, a big ceremony, and then get her visa situated and take her back to Belgium with them. And her concern was, as a Buddhist, that there's no Buddhist temples in Belgium. She didn't know if there was or not. And in Buddhism, they need temples to do merit. See, that's what Buddhism is all about, is doing a bunch of ceremonies, making a bunch of merit. It's not about teachings, and not about following teachings, it's all about ceremonies. And if you don't have a temple, you can't do the ceremonies. You don't do the ceremonies, you can't make merit. So, she, waiting here for her fiance, decided to go to the temple every day to do a lot of ceremonies, to make a lot of merit, as she feared that in Belgium, there'd be no Buddhist temples. And as she was going to the temple every day, the abbot of the temple got upset. You see, in Buddhist temples are filled with Buddhist monks. We call them monks in English. And they wear robes. Yes, robes. No underwear. They're not allowed to wear underwear under those robes. And, and in Buddhism, they're trying to control everything about their lives. Every breath they take, control their hair growing, their fingernails growing. They, they get into this stuff in the Buddhist temples and they're not allowed to have excuse my language, an erection. And if they ever have an erection, well, you'll see it under the robes they wear because they're wearing these light, small robes that are tight to the body with no underwear and they're not allowed to have erections. Well, that's going against nature. And when this 20-year-old girl with long hair came to the temple bowing down, making merit, doing all those ceremonies, those young monks would have erections. And the abbot got upset. He didn't get upset at the young monks, he got upset at this young girl who kept coming there every day. He felt she was bothering his disciples, the monks at the temple, and he's the abbot of the temple. So he hired gangsters to go pick that lady up and kill her. That was what she said. That was her side of the story. Now I've, I've preached this story in churches all over Thailand, and I've never once yet had a typer say, no, that's not true, that never happens. They all agree, that's how Buddhism is practice. And so, as she told us her story, we got to preach the gospel to her. And of course, she believed in Jesus. I mean, Buddhists were about to kill her on the authority of a Buddhist monk because of Buddhist teachings of karma. And then as she was about to be killed, Christians show up out of nowhere. We weren't supposed to be there. Nobody walks around that area that part of the, at that hour of the night. And praise God, we're able to save her from those people about to kill her. So if she didn't believe in Jesus, she would become the biggest fool in hell, amen. So naturally, of course, she believed in Jesus right there in the truck. We got to the police station. The man was yelling at the police about me. It was my fault. His windshield's been smashed. I need to pay him 5,000 baht for the windshield. The police let me know that is the law in Thailand. If you do help somebody and something goes wrong, well, you, the helper, must do the paying and I did not have any money. They did not believe I didn't have any money, so they, by law, they're gonna have to put me in jail. And the police, he didn't want to put me in jail. He took me outside to the police station and told me he understood my case and he saw that I was a good guy and it was a very noble deed that I did, but according to law, I'd have to pay for that windshield. If I didn't, he told me he would have to put me in jail, though he didn't want to do that. While this was going on, the young girl went to the payphone. Now it's 2014 and we have mobile phones, but back then, very few people had mobile phones, and we used a thing called pay phones, where you put some coins in a little telephone, and, and you can make phone calls. And she went to the pay phone and told her mother all that was happening. Her mother raced to the police station, and her mother showed up there with the money to pay for the man's windshield, because that's how Thai law works. And she was willing to pay that money because, compared to her daughter's life and 5,000 baht, 5,000 baht is not much money. So she paid for the windshield and that man left. I wasn't happy that they took that lady's money like that, but that's how it works. And then the mother gave us a ride back to where we're staying at that church in her truck. And so of course we preached the gospel to the mother as well. And 
if she didn't believe in Jesus, she would end up as the biggest fool in hell. So of course they believed in Jesus. They give us a ride to the church we're staying at. My wife and I, we took showers, you know, used, got ready for bed. We spent some time praying and reading our Bibles. It's about four o'clock in the morning. We eventually got to sleep. About seven in that morning, somebody began beating at the door that we're staying at, beating very hard. Hitting the door so hard that you can see the door moving from the inside. That's how hard they're beating on that door. And I had just gotten into a deep sleep and I thought for sure it was those gangsters. They had found me or the other gangsters that were against me preaching the gospel. But somebody has come here to do me bodily harm. So when I answered the door, it was that sister who sells the noodles. She began yelling at me and opened the door. She says, Brother Tony, I have no idea what you did last night, but God had me pray for you all night long. She said, I didn't get any sleep. I've been praying for you all night. She took out some money, 500 baht, which is a little bit over $10, and said, here, God told me to give this to you too, and threw the money at me, and I walked away and left. God still supplied our need. We thought maybe 20 baht, we got blessed with 500 baht. But praise God, we didn't get blessed with that 20 baht. Praise God we had to walk, and praise God I didn't give up, because we never would have met that girl. And that girl would have been murdered and went straight to hell because of some evil people. But praise God, we were there at that time. And the reason why we're there is I didn't give up because I began rejoicing in the God of my salvation. Are you saved? You can believe in Jesus Christ and be saved. Jesus Christ says if any man comes to him, Jesus Christ, he'll no ways cast him away. The Bible says, let him that is a thirst come. Whosoever is earth come, but him that heareth come. The Bible says, whosoever will, that's you, come and let him take the water of life freely. You may say, well, I've committed a lot of sins. The Bible says, come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be made white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Christ says, come to him. If you're not saved, you can be saved, just come to Jesus Christ. The Bible says if any man sin, we have an advocate with God, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. God is willing for all men to be saved. If you're not saved, you can be. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thine house. And if you are saved, or if you get saved now, you have a reason to rejoice. You may not have money now, you may be going through hard times now, but you can be happy. Why? Our life on this earth is very short. The Bible says, what is your life? It is a vapor. It appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. My eldest daughter is now 13 years old. It seems just like yesterday when she was born. I remember it just like it was yesterday. My son, he is now 11 years old and is almost as tall as me. I thought just a few days ago, he just came up down to here, my knees. And now he's almost as tall as me. Our life on this earth is very short. In fact, the Bible says it's only for a little time and vanisheth away. The troubles you're going through today is only a little time but eternity is forever. When you die, you either go to heaven for eternity or to hell for eternity. Are you saved? If you're saved, you can rejoice. If you're saved, you have something to be happy about. If you're saved, no matter what you're going through today, you can still have a smile on your face. You have a reason to praise God and you can think about eternity and what awaits you in heaven above. As the Bible says, I have not seen, nor hath ear heard into the heart of man, the things that God hath prepared for them that love him. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved and thine house. I'm praying for you. I'm praying that you would get saved. I'm praying that you could have what I have. Jesus Christ says, freely have you received, freely shall you give. I got saved freely. It didn't cost me a thing, and it doesn't cost you a thing to listen to what I'm preaching today. And it won't cost you a thing to get saved if you come to Jesus Christ.
For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. God bless you. I'm praying for you.